We are now heading to the last event of this day, of the first day, and that will be a slightly different format, as you have probably guessed, uh, because of the appearance of this sofa here on stage next to me. Uh, it indicates that we will close the day with a panel discussion, uh, a panel discussion in the intuitive tech content track, um, dealing with uh, lots of the stuff that we have heard today, and that was mm, arguably, arguably best addressed by Annie Wang, who said that Generation Z is already expecting the integration of technology in spaces, and how do we deal with that? Well, we found a really great group of experts uh, willing to talk about that from various angles. So I would like to call to the stage Kathy Barklund, Senior Manager, Workplace Strategy at Tenant and Partner, Christoph Babinski, Managing Director of ASB Glassfloor. That's the company who provided this floor and the cubicle at the end of the space. Rachel Arthur, you will hear more of her tomorrow. She is the Chief Innovation Officer of The Current. And Ren Yi, Head of Innovation Strategy and Forecasting at the Amsterdam-based architecture studio, UN Studio. The discussion will be moderated by one of Frame's editors, Lauren Grace Morris. People, put your hands together for this really great group. Good luck, Lauren. Thank you, Robert. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see all of your faces today. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> so today, we're talking about intuitive tech and what it means to be digital by design. We're living the future once uh, reserved for the imagination of uh, science fiction, cinema, and literature. And as our technologies evolve, so must the space we inhabit, both for our collective advancement and for our personal well-being at home and beyond. The design community has a unique responsibility to come together to navigate the vast realm of technological possibility in our spaces. And our society is increasingly data-driven. We're at the precipice of a, sens of a sensorial shift that will completely uproot that of which is most natural to us. So are the architecture and design industries prepared for the disappearing boundary between physical and digital? And are they possibly lag lagging behind other sectors? That's an open question for any, any of you who would like to uh, jump in. Yes, yeah, so all we really, I hope, <laughs> I really hope that we all, because we must. Um, yeah, uh, and especially uh, if we want to create very good experiences. We need to look at the space more holistically, also bringing uh, the digital side of it much more than we have traditionally done. I also think that new opportunities open up to architects and designers out there with the introduction of more flexible materials and spaces that are, um, that are able to adapt and to transform information or to translate information to the user of a building or space. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think that. Uh, can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear me? I think uh, we need a. Can you hear me? No? Mic check. <laughs> yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think it's a very interesting discussion about the duality of physical and digital space. I think every one of us here lives both in digital domain. A lot of our time we spend in digital domain and now coming back to the design, I think we have been shifting on and off all the time between uh, mobile devices that is online and then now coming to data extractions and then now coming to websites. And we're always doing it in physical space. So in reality, there have always been a relation. So I think right now, when it comes to design industry, is to find the potential of that digital domain and bring us back in relation to the physical domain. And I think it should not be such a disconnection as we have done now. And right now, if you look at how it affects our social behavior, whenever we get on the phone, we get disconnected. We got zoomed out, but physically, we're just there as a zombie. 
But I think there's more than the potential on social, there's also a potential on understanding the, 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 the impact of our work as a designer. Now we start to use digital tool to understand a little bit more the implication of our building, of our space that we have. We start to observe a little of interesting behavioral change when it comes to when you apply technology in the physical space. So I, I think it's such an interesting domain between this duality and both of the world. And if you think about what, I mean, other companies like Google is doing, they're the gatekeeper of what they call the first, the first era of internet by Kevin Kelly. And now everyone is trying to come back to the physical world and say, how can we bridge that digital and physical world? And how can we create a better quality of life? And also something that we don't regret, trying to project what is the implication. So I do think it's going to be more and more mesh, what he called the mesh. Do you think at this point uh, there is much work to be done to catch up to other sectors, or do you I, think that we're... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, start. but from a digital, uh, from a designer, we always use, digital has always been the fundamental tool in everything that we do. We might not get real-time information on the implication, but digital has always been a, a great tool for us. But when it comes to actual space, you're right, there's a lot of things we're trying to catch up on. Mm -hmm. And right now you see a bit of a Wild West situation whereby everyone just put in sensors and try to read the physical environment and start to extract a lot of things coming out of it. But in reality, we as a designer feel something needs to be controlled. You need to use it in the right way and we are responsible for the things that we design. Mm -hmm. And therefore designers are always thinking about what is the implication. Mm -hmm. So I think we are in the foreground. I do think a lot of things are changing, but the industry is changing a little bit slower. So in that sense, I do think it's true. What, what is projected as potential compared to what is in reality is maybe a different pace. We have been a little bit of silo focused also. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we need to look at other, not just uh, uh, well, technology uh, side, but other related areas also and see how we can create better experiences and, um, yeah. Is this pressure to adapt, changing the way that you do business and the way that retailers in general are doing business, do you feel? I think I can probably... <laughs> there we go. I think I can probably answer here because my business only exists because of this gap. So we're a consultancy that basically sits somewhere in the middle of the consumer, the retailer, the designer, wherever it might be. And essentially, we go out and, and find the technologies that are going to help to you know, drive us to that next level, wherever that gap is that we've been talking about. And um, when I say that, you know, I don't mean, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow, I don't mean sort of gimmicky technology that necessarily sits on the front end, but how can we ensure that something is digital by design from the very beginning by going out and finding the experts that exist around the world? And I would argue that, strictly speaking, you know, everyone is behind in this space because the consumer is so much further ahead and actually the technology is so much further ahead which is why our business is called The Current. We talk all the time about the future but the point is this technology is here right now. We're not yet using it in the way that we can. And so I think that there's, there's a ton of catching up to do. I run our strategy team and it's all about you know, what does the consumer today actually demand? And actually, I think even the word demand is no longer right because it, as, as we heard somebody said earlier today, it, it really is about an expectation. Like, all of us know this, we use digital, so, um, you know, across the board and everything we do today, there is an expectation from what our sort of experiences is online that that would translate into a physical space. And I think there are very few examples of people that are genuinely doing that in a way that goes beyond just experiential and is actually like a, a truly seamless digital experience in the physical world. Ren, what technologies do you think can most fundamentally transform the way that we experience the space in retail and uh, workspaces and beyond? Um, I think that it's endless, but if you start from let's say data fusion, the, the process of, because as we know, I mean, we should also be careful that we don't uh, approach technology as a high potential or a, a great threat. So if you talk about data, data, data fusion, for example, everyone is going to be afraid of a lot of implication that comes with data. But I think by understanding the potential of what the data can be will be one of the way that would change the way we live in a space. And if you think about experiencing the space, I think the relation to um, augmented reality is going to be the next thing. Uh, it's, it is already been hub. It's a very constant reminder that augmented reality will arrange, change the way we live in the space with other people, but also coexist with the type of activity that we do with the space. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot has to do with also the technology of 
reading the data and understanding the implication on behavior. I think this is going to be a very important thing as well, like how do we understand the implication of space, how it changes our behavior when it comes to reacting to technology. Uh, yeah, these are some of them. I think the, the, the list is really endless. <laughs> And I think we need to do a lot more like collaboration. If I look at uh, my company, um, it's uh, been uh, working with workplace advisory uh, the last 30 years, and mainly for, well, uh, on the physical workplace side. Um, but now um, we have taken the step and collaborating with another uh, firm and together um, well, taking the grip of the whole workplace and, and helping the companies with not just the physical workplace because it's not enough. We won't be creating uh, the great experiences and uh, engaged and empowered work, workplaces and workforce. So um, that's really making us uh, be able to do much more than we have done before from just the physical angle, just embracing also the digital and also the leadership and culture, just seeing everything more holistically than we have done before from the silos. And just to build on what Ren was saying, from our side, we see technologies, particularly for retail at the moment, falling into three, three key brackets or three key trends. That would be convenience, experience, and personalization. And I think the, the winning technologies are ones that bridge all of those. So augmented reality is the perfect example. Convenience, because I can find more information. Experience, because I can have something experiential through this digital layer. And personalization, because it can be tailored and made relevant to me individually. And I think there's loads of great examples of that. But the one I always go back to is convenience, because I think there's a world of technology there that is not sexy, but is so important. And I was talking with the, the, the frame team before this for an interview, and, we, and my key point was that please, please, please go back to getting payments right, like pay, payment technology in a store in a way that is facilitated to make it seamless is far more important than having some nice bells and whistles, glamorous technology that makes your store look pretty. I know that's an important element, but if you don't get the fundamentals right from a tech perspective, you're not going to get any shoppers actually spending any money, and that's fundamentally what it comes down to. Yes, I think your specific example um, to Rab, the author that wrote that, was that you don't want another in-store yoga class. <laughs> You'd rather have updated payment systems. I, I would like to respond to that because uh, apart from my role being an architect, it looks into the, the, what's going to happen in terms of innovation and forecasting. I'm also heading a new st set, uh, startup by, by a UN studio called UN Sense. And we're, bit, we're dealing with a smart city solution down to smart building. So the convenience has a very, very interesting perspective because we are talking about the, the double edge of technology, the, the double edge sort of technology. At one point, it can make a lot of the operation of the business and the experience of the consumer really positive and bring it to the next dimension. But also, I think to address the elephant in the room, when you talk about technology, there's also a lot of interesting also maybe scary facts when it comes to convenience, to what extent does the convenience affect the collective, for example. So the discussion about how, Google, uh, how Uber is such an amazing uh, transportation that gives you convenience from point A to point B, but what is it affecting on the industry itself? And what, is the effect, what does it affect on the collectiveness? So I think as a designer, just to, to, to hop on that, there is this two side that we constantly have to revisit. One is to design a better environment for us, the other one is to know the implication of the next three steps to come. So therefore, convenience, in my opinion, has double-edged, it's a double-edged sword. Christoph, from a business perspective, how can tech companies like yours uh, help designers and architects better understand the potentials uh, for unlocking space? I think what we do is try to turn LED screens, which are normally used for digital signers, and shout, they shout at you. We try to turn them into a versatile architectural and a tactile surface. So that allows the designer to have a complete flexible element in terms of design, and that allows for different applications of the same area. So I think that looking into the future, looking into crowded cities, looking into more and more urbanization, we need more multifunctional spaces. And if you look at what we at ASB do in uh, the world of sports, 
is we've created a sports floor out of glass and you press a button, you have a basketball field, you press a button, you have a volleyball field. So you have what you need at a time and the technology should only work in the background. So at the moment what happens a lot in architecture and retail design is that we use technology to shout out, to draw the customer in. But what we need to do is exactly what you said, Ren, we need to try and create a better environment and that works quite well with hidden spaces. So if we have an LED wall and we don't use it to shout at people, but we use it to translate a certain ambience in a room depending on what it's used for, then we suddenly create that multifunctionality and that additional benefit for the client that he can use. So if, for example, Microsoft has a uh, 150 square meter digital floor, they can use that for all sorts of spaces. So they can run activity that is with kids where they put a big board game down there and the kids are actually the figures moving along the board game. At the same time, they can, time they can use that for a high-end stakeholder presentation. So I think it's that versatility that the digital technology allows us um, to play with. Katie, do you find uh, in workspaces that users come back uh, and back and back and back to wanting uh, one of the same things, what elements are these people that are working most wanting in their space? What technology? If, yeah, if, if you look at, I, I work with um, uh, workplaces and employees, of course we want to have a personalized uh, experience and support with, well, my, my work and my situation, so uh, essentially uh, when I enter the building, um, you will know who I am, uh, what I'm working on, uh, what I like, where I'm going to, what meeting I have, with whom, and, and um, the building in, the, in that sense will be able to help me and guide me in every step I take in that space. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the question that pops up for me over and over again is how we keep intuitive tech truly intuitive. And that is, uh, how do we ensure that people of all ages and backgrounds can really understand the new technologies that are coming into spaces and helping us experience them better? Um, I, I think this is where the designer instinct comes in. I think we are, we are supposed to bridge that gap. Um, that's why you have UX designers, you have spatial designers, you have all these designers. Uh, and, and I think from my personal experience is that you have to do this through test, trial, and error. And technology allow us to, to, to play with. And I think a lot of collaboration to address what Katie was talking about. The silo is getting lower. Uh, everyone with a new technology owner wants to see if they can test their technology. And this is also what we felt from an architecture perspective. There's a lot of people willing to test and develop something with us. So we should be able to try that and develop the technology together and see if it's truly intuitive, if it works. Mm. And, and there's no other way than to do this, what I would quote the software, uh, software lingo, the A-B testing. And I think we should start to do A-B testing in physical space with technology. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but wouldn't you, st well, I, I, my view on this would be that one of the key things the designer has to look at is to try and take the user interface completely away. Um, so rather than the user choosing what he wants to do with technology, the technology should guide the user, yes, but it should take him on a certain set path that is influenced by the user's actions, but not actively. So if the user wanted to change something in that technological framework around you, he shouldn't have an interface to do so. Then it should be there and it should be allowed, but what we need to understand is that intuitive tech is, is very, very important. But a space is always a space for more than one person. So that means, and we see that a lot when we have digital installations in buildings or in exhibitions. The moment a single user controls it, you either have a group of people waiting, being bored by that, or if something is a decorative element, for example, someone, one person is in charge of it, you'll see the same thing over and over again because at one point they, they get bored with playing with an interface and it just, it's just a job of putting something on. But by designing the element in a way that you have a certain entity in charge of controlling it, you can ensure that the necessary creative content, for example, comes to it and it changes and it worries. And it also doesn't confuse people because if someone's not very interested in the technological side of things, then they can simply go through and ignore that. Yeah. 
And if you just think, I've, I've seen some crazy elevated systems, for example, and you get a number and then you need to wait until your number comes up because they try to mix and match you with other people going to the same area. These are nightmares. They don't work. They simply do not work because the interface doesn't work. So I think the key part for a designer is to make sure the inter interface yeah. fits the purpose of the space. It's, it's interesting because a lot of technology owner controls the interface and they work with end user to improve the interface, yeah. but you're restricted by the framework. And um, this is also where we see the, the, the direction where technology is developing. They're going into more distributed and adaptive systems, so a system that could talk to other systems. So if it is a technology that is restrictive, that designers can't break out of the framework, then the question is if this is the right final technology that you're using. And I think right now more and more professionals are willing to cross the boundary of the industry to become, uh, I don't know, a part of export their software or export their technology into a different domain. So I think exactly this is right. Designers need to question. Designer needs to know this is not the only technology you could use. You could start to develop something to, together with another technology owners. Yeah, well, if, the, if, if a user interface simply follows the, the path of an individual rather than making the individual press buttons, then that is truly intuitive and that works around you. But if you have someone having to stand in front of a panel and then typing in, let's say I'm in a big office building, I want to get to room 507E. So I'll type it in and then I find it, that doesn't work. But if I log in at a reception, it tracks me and then it would follow me through the building and give me the necessary signage that I need to find room 406E, then that works for me. But I wouldn't stop three times to try and find that map again and type in the number of the room again to see where I have to go. Yeah. And I think this is what I meant about convenience in terms of, you know, there, and I totally agree with what you were saying earlier as well, but I think in this case, what we're talking about is something that's frictionless and seamless, and I think that's so important. And I think the other side is thinking and designing for who the actual user is, and it doesn't always have to be the end consumer. We forget so often when we put technology in retail, particularly that the user really is the sales associate and they don't get training, or they get training. And there's so many times when I'm a journalist by background and I'd go to the launch of a new store and I remember the H&M store in Times Square, and it was this amazing technological feat. This is probably about seven or eight years ago, at a time when like, tech in retail was just starting to really buzz from a PR perspective. And this was headlines all over the place about this store. And I went to the launch, and it was incredible. And it was this sort of, it was basically like a catwalk where you could go and have your um, selfie taken. And then it was put up on this huge billboard all around Times Square in real time. And there was various other tech ele elements to it. And um, the amazing thing was you went back a week later and nothing was working. And this was in a whole mezzanine level given over to this experience area with it all cordoned off and massive error signs. And I w tried to speak to all the different sales associates and nobody, not a single person had a clue why it wasn't working or who to speak to to fix it. And it was amazing. It was just such a basic example of how technology can fail in a beautifully designed space if it's not thought through from the user experience perspective, and in this case, it being just simple training of the sales associates. And imagine that when you then try and scale it across all of your H&M stores or whatever uh, retailer you might be. Yeah, I, I think we also, as a designer, have to be careful which tech is gimmick and which tech is actually deep tech that actually could be used. I like the discussion about shy technology. So because ultimately, if you want to create an experience, there are certain things that you can do on the superficial a uh, 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 surface that you can actually interact with, technology that changes the space. But if we talk about technology here, we're talking about really, really deep technology that changes the way we behave, changes the way we use the space, changes the operation model, how we shop in the future. So these, in the end, it, it, we as a designer, I think we just have to understand the depth and the, the potential and see what is gimmick and what is not. Uh, Rachel, since Technology has uh, such uh, massive implications for fashion industry and, and all, all industries. Uh, do you think as retailers uh, rapidly try and adopt these technologies that retail can teach something to other industries that are looking to incorporate, um, looking to incorporate data-driven technologies? Yeah, I mean, and, and I wouldn't say that is specific just to fashion, but obviously retail full stop is, you know, front line of, of customer experience in terms of, of, of daily potential interactions. I think where we see real learnings there are the brands that are digital first. And again, I'll talk about this more tomorrow, but, you know, the, the, 
the digitally native direct-to-consumer brands that are entering the space, whether they're mattresses or eyewear or footwear or you name it, any type of business these days that has, has desi decided to sort of shake up the business model. And, you know, what we're seeing is all of them launch into physical spaces. Obviously, been a sort of real retail renaissance around these kinds of brands. Casper, the mattress brand, I think, is saying it's opening 200 stores over the next few years in, in the U.S., which, um, you know, sits alongside a lot of other traditional retailers in the U.S. obviously closing. And I think brands like that can teach us a lot in terms of technology because by being digitally first, by their very nature, they are customer first, and therefore they have a very, very strong understanding of who they're dealing with. So when they are opening uh, stores, it's, it's not even necessarily about technology, but it's about community, it's about customer, and they know how to put things in place that are really about driving that engagement. And, 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 of, and often, more often than not, the reason for having those stores in the first place is customer acquisition as well, which I think is um, particularly interesting. So, so yes, it's the short version, but I think there's lots of nuanced ways that that's, that's happening right now. And I think also it's good within that industry because it's all quite often like business case based and, uh, and really yeah, focusing on the customer. I think in many cases when we use technology, it's, it's, we don't always have a good well, business case behind it. For example, when using IoT in many of the, uh, well, spaces that we have, uh, is this really something that gives us value and an enough value for the cost of it, for example. Um, mm. So yeah, I think that we really need to mm. focus on the purpose and why we are bringing in technology. What are we trying to solve with it? Mm. Um, yeah. I think, that's, I think that's critical and that goes back to the, the balance between what's gimmicky tech and what's actually foundational. And I think that, that today is the sort of root of all of it. You know, if, I think consumers now, you know, at that time when I talked about the H&M store, it, it, it worked initially because of the fact that everybody was kind of a little bit blindsided by this like really flashy tech. You know, it yeah. was all about the sort of the story and the excitement and going in and, and people getting to interact with something. And, and consumers aren't, they don't care about that anymore. Don't, it's not that they don't want to interact, but you know, it has to have something that's beyond just the gimmick. It has to have that layer underneath, which, as I said, could be about seamless, but equally, you know, we're talking about the sales associates and as an example. I'm really interested in the way that, you know, machine learning is impacting the way a sales associate will have a conversation with you even, because that, to me, the customer experience, is that's the next level that's actually fundamentally important for the future of retail. Workplaces are really the alternative of that, right? Because you're looking for long-term solutions for problems which make working uncomfortable. Um, yeah, I, I say like all corporates today have challenges with attractivity, productivity, efficiency, sustainability, security, and workplace, a workspace is an area that is key to yeah, improve all of those areas and especially together with technology. So I think that we together uh, within, for example, workplace, within workplace, with the digital and physical workplace, and also leadership culture can really create much more attractive and productive workplaces, and also more inspiring and meaningful work life, because that's also what we essentially want. Absolutely. Just to uh, jump on that, I, have to, I, have to, I want to react to yours as well as yours. Uh, I'm a bit, a bit we have a couple of minutes. Yes. So. Um, <laughs> I think the, the technology changing in the retail landscape, one of the best examples is by Amazon Go. And they're pushing the forefront of technology whereby it even changes the way you shop, pick up something and leave the store. It sounds very simple, but the whole foundation of the technology evolving behind it is immense, it's amazing. They have field sensing, they have uh, computer vision, they have data analytics, they could analyze if someone is picking something up, dropping it back, or just scratching and leave an opening on eating something. So that technology, from a consumer perspective, we are not aware of, but they're amazing technology. So I think the technology, therefore, coming back to the idea of how H&M look at it from a gimmicky sense, or how Amazon look at it from a revolutionizing... Convenience. Convenience. <laughs> <laughs> so just to react on that, but also to react on the, um, the, the future of workspace, I couldn't, agree, I couldn't disagree with, with you. I think I couldn't agree with you more. 
the workspace is such an important element in the, the, the society today. We spend a lot of time working. We don't, don't only work in offices. We work in a lot of spaces. Everywhere. We work everywhere. <laughs> and the, the 2000, this is a bit old, but it's the only report I know, that they are stating that people spend over 80% of their time indoor. So when it comes to workspace, spending time indoor, looking into how we are working, we're looking also into how the space is affecting our health. So how do, does it affect the processes, but also how does it affect us from a physical health perspective, sitting too much? You know, this technology needs to nudge you and say, you're sitting too much, you need to do something. Uh, 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 on a uh, physical, uh, social health, how can technology help us not to take away job from us, but actually accentuate and bring up the best thing that the quality of human can? That doctor Give us man. superpowers. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, and not to rival with automation, but then actually bring up the best part of the human. So that's a, maybe on the connection, relate working better with people, so there's on social health. So I think when it comes to the health, the work environment, technology can do so much if done in the right way, because on the wrong way, the China, China is an example whereby they observe every single emails and actions, reactions, behavior, and then start to be able to turn it around to create a bit of a, man, a manipulation. So we also don't want to go technology. Compliance is really essential. Yeah. Like everything, and security. we need a healthy balance, and uh, technology is not absent from that rule. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me for the panel discussion today, and I hope you all enjoyed. Um, and for more frame, more frame lab. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy Barklun, Christoph Babinski, Rachel Arthur, Renyi, and Lauren Morris. <laughs> this is your time to walk the cat. <laughs> the end again. Thank you. I very, waited for this for long. <laughs> it was a very engaging discussion. Thank you for that.